Hello, I'm Morag Gamble and welcome to this episode of Sense Making the Changing World podcast. This conversation is part of my International Women's Day series, celebrating amazing contributions of inspirational women courageously leading from the hyperlocal and community. On this podcast, I invite you to join me each week in conversation with leading permaculture-related educators, thinkers, activists, authors, designers, and practitioners to explore the kind of thinking and action we need to navigate a positive and regenerative way forward, to myceliate possibilities and to share ideas of what a thriving one-planet way of life could look like. My guests offer voices of clarity and common sense. In this episode, I'm joined by Helen Lendorf, community permaculture advocate, teacher, mother writer, and writing teacher from the North Island of New Zealand. She teaches in the School of English and Media Studies at Massey University. We're walking today through her recently published creative non-fiction memoir, A Forager's Life published in 2023 by HarperCollins. This is her third book, the first being a book of poetry, followed by Right to the Centre about her lifelong habit of keeping a journal. I love chatting with Helen. Our ways of seeing the world and showing up as practical activists align so much. As well as permaculture, Helen loves nature writing, eco-poetics, music, journaling and connecting with plants. She also teaches yoga, meditation and runs retreats for women. In this conversation, Helen explores the concept of home as a sense of nourishment and connection with the land. We discuss her journey of becoming ecologically conscious and the importance of being fully immersed in nature. Helen emphasises the reciprocal relationship with plants and the wisdom of plant tending. She also highlights the significance of hyperlocal food systems and the power of food commons and radical reciprocity. Our conversation touches on the intersection of permaculture and motherhood too, and the importance of social permaculture and the practice of writing and nature journaling. We finish up with a chat about the long view of permaculture and the creation of cultures of permanence, regenerative cultures. Before we head to the conversation, I'd like to begin first by acknowledging that I'm recording this episode from my hand-built solar-powered studio here on beautiful Gubby Gubby country. I'm surrounded here by my permaculture design gardens in a permaculture eco-village. The Sense Making in a Changing World podcast is a project of the Permaculture Education Institute. We teach permaculture design, teaching and livelihood skills online to people on six continents who in turn localise and enrich it and find appropriate ways to apply the planet care ethics of earth care, people care and fair share wherever they are. Remember to subscribe to The Sense Making in a Changing World on your favourite podcast app, to share it freely and to leave us a five-star review and lovely comment. It really does help people find our podcast. Alrighty, well, let's turn to this beautiful conversation with Helen Lendorf. Thank you for being here. Well, hello and welcome and thank you for joining me, Helen, on The Sense Making the Changing World Show. It's so wonderful to have you here. Um, I've been reading through, um, for the second or third time, your beautiful book, A Forager's Life, which I understand is your third book. But my heart was singing as I was Mm -hmm. reading this book. There was just every page there was something that you wrote about such a deep connection with plants, with the world and being cradled by the earth and being regenerated and rejuvenated by just being in connection with the land. And, and there's something that, there's a question I've been holding, maybe we can start here, is this sense of what is home? I've been ex- trying to find the words to explain mm. what is home, with sense of home that you feel nourished because you you know where the food is the water is and how it holds you there's a there's this deeper relationship than just being in a house in a place and I felt there was something very tangible about how you wrote that just oozed from the pages about this concept of home and I wonder whether we could just begin there about exploring what home means for you Mm. oh thank you so much Warwick Um, I'm thrilled to be here um I, I said to you before we got on that I'm a massive super fan of yours, uh, of the Morag geek. Um, and I just want to total call, which is Māori, for deeply acknowledge your contribution to the permaculture world. Oh, so thank, thank you, Helen. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, I think I heard you sort of talk to Tyson Young Kapoor about uh, concepts of home in one of the previous podcasts, and um, he's such a great digressive roaming <laughs> thinker, isn't he? So that was really, yeah, that was a wonderful conversation. Um, but for me, I think home has become, um, like I'm age 51 now, so I've got like half a century of life. <laughs> um, I think it's sort of like a field of um, ecological consciousness. Well, when I am able to enter a field of ecological consciousness, I can find home anywhere, <laughs> if that makes sense. I can feel how much I am a part of everything else and how connected I am to everything else. So, yeah. So what does ecological consciousness mean to you and how how did you happen to find yourself in that place? Yeah. Like how does one become ecologically conscious? Oh, well, yeah, that's a massive question. I think, <laughs> I, think I was super fortunate to grow up um, out, outside a lot. Um, in, in the memoir, I talk about my childhood. My father um, is a passionate fisherman, hunter, He's a butcher by trade, um, so a very practical man, um, and he loves nature, loves the bush, loves the ocean. Uh, he can read rivers, like he's he's just a master fisherman, and I've, stu I've stood beside him. Um, I'm not really a, a fisherwoman, <laughs> uh, even though I did a bit of it when I was growing up. But, yeah, I, I think my father, just through, um, through his relationship with... Um, and um, embeddedness in the natural world. I don't think he was an inspiration when I was young, but when I look back, I feel so grateful. Um, and now I see how much of his way of being in nature seeded in my brother and I. Um, so we uh, got usually got dragged along on his <laughs> adventures. Um, and so, yeah, which is a digressive way of saying that um, I think I was fortunate enough to sort of live it from along uh, a very young age. I was just chucked outside, basically. <laughs> and so that gives that that gave me a foundation of a sense knowing through my body and my senses as well as my brain. Um, and I feel so lucky for that because I know if people have grown up in a very urban way, in a way uh, a bit detached from seasons and food production and all those sorts of things. Um, I, I observe, like when I used to teach um, creative writing at university, um, young people like that, it, it has to be a learnt thing and, and it, it seems to be often learnt through ideas first and then hopefully if they get inspired through their body and through their experience. So if you're lucky enough to, to start young and, and it's an embodied thing, then um, that thing I'm talking about it, of ecological consciousness is a very um, somatic thing as much as an intellectual thing. Yeah, that's – it's a beautiful way of thinking about it, isn't it, that when you just are fully immersed, like you are talking about your father's experience of being fully immersed and embedded, and, and that there's something not just about – I don't know, there's something not just about going out to nature, but it's actually being in nature and that, that, that you are nature and nature is, is mm. you know, nourishing you. Like you're in relationship because it's part of your nourishment. There is that reciprocity that's going on there. It's not just going out to nature for a walk to, to calm down or mm. there is something more that's going on there, which is why he became so finely attuned which is why I think there's something really important about uh, the permaculture way of gardening, that it really mm -hmm. helps to to take that sort of that learnt experience of ideas and knowledge and grounds it deeply in mm. place and, and in a relationship where there is some sort of reciprocity going on there. I find somehow if we just talk about um, going out to nature, that it's nature out there. Yeah, and I feel in the narratives that I'm seeing in a lot of places, there is still this this real split mm. with what you're talking about. Something much more deeper, and as you say, like this real somatic whole mm. whole body, mind, soul experience of of embeddedness and 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 uh, support, which is kind of a it's a radical concept for 
contemporary humans, but it's not radical for human for humanity for most of humanity's existence, is it? Oh, I so agree. Yeah, that um, nature human binary that is a real false binary, <laughs> constructed binary. Um, as you say, you know, we are nature. We're part of that um, mycelial map. <laughs> Something else that comes along with that physically um, embodied sense of ecological consciousness is that um, we get into a less extractive way of looking at nature as well. Um, so like, even though my memoir is about foraging and I love foraging and I still forage, um, I notice as I get older, I just take less um, and just, I still like to go and visit all the superstars of the seasons. Um, there are some things I will always, um, <laughs> always forage like it's uh, just a couple of weeks ago here it was elderberry season and I love to forage elderberries because I make winter medicines with them so some things I still do forage but I noticed that a lot of the time now I just sort of like to visit and talk to those seasonal plants um, and, and really enjoy because I, I, I have a big um, food garden at home as well um, but I think a massive gift that foraging has given me is that it, it gives us uh, a much more literacy in the changes of the seasons because you know when we're growing food um, we're sort of um, encouraging things by planting them ourselves or whatever <laughs> but when you're out foraging uh, the wild foods present themselves in your bioregion when all the things all the elements are optimal for those plants so uh, as a forager I think uh, everything we think we know about about the seasons and calendars goes away and you realize like yes we have a broad sense of when the seasons are loosely um, but when you're foraging you realize that it changes so much year to year and so you might be by the river I might be by the river and you know I'll think oh well the fennel seeds are slow to dry this year but you, next year they maybe they'll be back to the schedule of the year before <laughs> um, so the seasons are wonderfully unpredictable and um and the, yeah the, and foraging gives us bioregional um literacy like in a way that even food growing can't i think i might have wandered off the path of your question there but... oh no no it's, it's a beautiful response and, yeah. and it's actually it's a way that i really try to read the the garden that surrounds my home mm. as well so not not going by a, a chart of I must plant this and this and yes. this. What's what's emerging at this time? What are mm -hmm. the what's the wildness that's that's happening in that space, and how can that maybe define how I am in relationship with the garden from this point? Rather than having a plan that I impose on it, I'm kind of in a dance with it, and yeah. it's a different. It's a di it's a shift in how you know I've learnt to garden over the decades, and I really really appreciate yes. that yeah uh, there's a garden writer in New Zealand called Linda Helen and and um, I really like her writing um, she writes for a lot of the popular gardening magazines here she writes across lots of different gardening styles um, in an article where she was talking about a garden tour that she went on um, she was sort of describing you know some of the gardens were very formal and and then she talked about the permissive permaculture, permaculture gardens permissive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I was so tickled by that choice of word because um you know so for, for her she's sort of more in the tradi traditional gardening world um and she really appreciates the permaculture world's world but she saw saw the gardens as permissive like we let things go to see they're a bit rumpety and wild um and, <laughs> and i think um both foraging and gardening in a permaculture way um like you just used the word wild in your home food garden mm. um it's it's yeah i don't we see it less as we're being permissive and uh, even though I loved love what Linda wrote and more that um we're allowing um what nature wants to do to happen more <laughs> and and trying to like be in a, a bit of a flow with it like you never are entirely when you're when you're doing food growing you 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 have got your plan and all that sort of thing but um yeah just allowing more wildness and and happenstance and and allowing plants to go through their full life cycle. Like even, even the fact that permaculture gardeners allow plants to go through their full life cycle because we seed save, 
is so radical and it really blows the minds of people who grow vegetables and fruit traditionally. Um, so like our vegetable garden is out the front of our house and quite often I get um, neighbours, usually older men to be honest, <laughs> some set ideas about vegetable garden gardening, um, leaning on the fence and sort of saying, oh, your parsley's bolted, you know, you need to, it's going to go to seed and da da da. And I'll say, oh no, I've, I'm leaving it there because I want to, I want to get those seeds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they sort of look really confused. Like, why would you do that? And you can go and buy a packet of parsley seeds for $3. Um, or else something else that will happen is that people will say, oh, what are those purple flowers? And I'll say, oh, that's a lettuce that's um, flowered. And they'll be like, lettuce has purple flowers? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be like, yes, you know, this is once it just goes beyond bolting and it grows up and up and up, this is what it does. And they're, and they're sort of so sort of surprised and delighted. Uh, and it's it's wonderful, isn't it? There is so much colour and it, it, they attract so many beneficial insects into the garden. Yes. But it is so surprising too, is and I and I and I love that that mm. you know, these kind of gardens can help really to reconnect us like right in the middle of urban and suburban areas mm. with something to do with our food system, something to do with how nature works to build our eco-literacy. And so wherever we are, we can find these possibilities. But I wanted to circle back to what you're talking about, talking with plants. Now, um, <laughs> I have a tendency to do this too. Sometimes, I must admit, even out aloud, not normally when I'm around other people, <laughs> but just when I'm with the plants themselves. Like for the other, the other day, for example, I there's this... Um, polonia tree that popped up um as mm. as kind of a weed in my garden its roots had come from the neighbors and I kind of let it do its thing because I really love to do a, a chop and a drop mm. to use its leaves somewhere in the garden but anyway it's, it looked so beautiful and its leaves were so big and luscious and I went across to it <laughs> and I just wanted a couple of leaves for this thing that I was doing mm. and so I I sort of stood back and I looked at the tree and then I kind of almost like asked for its permission like which leaves do you think I could mm. take today? And so I took a couple and I actually said, oh, thank you, as I was walking off. Mm. And I, was, I just noticed myself <laughs> in this conversation with this plant thinking, yeah. wow. And I do that with the herbs as well. Mm. And I, there's something really, I don't, I can't not do it anymore, I think is what I'm trying mm. to say. Mm. Like I just, I can there is a there is a conversation that happens when you are in relationship with this community. You're part of a community, I think. Mm. And I wonder, um, you know, you've talked a lot in in your writings about your relationship with plants, and it's a deep one from your early mm. childhood. And I wonder, like, how do you feel about when you're walking through your garden, for example? Um, and is it different from when you're walking through a wild space? Like, does your relationship <laughs> oh. with plants shift where you are? Does the context matter? As you know from the book, I talk to plants also sometimes just non-verbally, sometimes verbally. Um, I used to feel quite nutty doing that, but now I am more accepting of myself and the phenomena that, that's happening. Yeah, I think I, I, something I noticed too, harvesting, I don't know if you've ever felt this, it's sort of, it's not logical, it's like a sense knowing. But sometimes if I'm like picking flowers to put in a vase or harvesting and I'm when I'm in an open sort of space and I'm trying to be with the plant, I'll just, I'll be picking and then I'll just get a sudden, a feeling of a message like, that's enough, that's enough. Like, do you ever experience yeah, that? Yeah. yeah oh, really. that's so yeah. great. I feel so crazy <laughs> saying that usually. <laughs> but it's sort no, of like, it's not it because... Yeah. And, and I, mean, I think that's what I was sort of trying to say too about this plant that I was – hmm. I could go and easily just take the whole branch and rip off all the leaves yeah. like as an extractive thing. <laughs> but when you sort of stop and you pause before you do it and you have a relationship, it, it, there's an indication of like, oh, I am – yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of what I would like you to say today. Yeah, or... <laughs> yeah and it's, it's such a beautiful that's enough as well. It's like firm but friendly and it's sort of like – it's not like being told off. It's like, um, like that's that's enough for you today to take to eat or mm. enjoy, um, and also that's enough if you want me, the me, the plant, to keep being able to be as generous as I can be if I'm well loved and well kept, mm. cared for. Um, so yeah, it's not a it's not a cross. That's enough. It's sort of <laughs> like a. <laughs> 
I don't know. It's it's more subtle than that. Yeah. 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 Is that just something you've always felt or is it as you've as you've deepened into your art of growing mm. or understanding more? Has it come with the, your wisdom of plant tending or has it come, is it just mm. always been a yeah, well, thing I, your parents talked about? Or oh, even? no, um, parents were definitely not talking about talking to plants, <laughs> even though they both love plants and love nature. My mum's a, a great gardener. Um, no, um, but I think when I was younger, I could feel it, but I couldn't quite understand what's happening or it was more just, um, it was there, but I never, sometimes I didn't quite know what to do with it and then, um, or what it meant. And then as I've learned gardening and I've learned permaculture and then something that really accelerated it for me was when I started to make medicinal things with plants. And then, so I feel like, yeah, right from when I was tiny in the book, I talk about when I was four and, and something happened with a blackberry bush. Um, so it was there from when I was young, but then when I started making medicinal things, like I, I'm not a trained herbalist or anything, I'm just a keen home herbalist. <laughs> it, it really accelerated there because I was so in love with the medicinal properties of the wild plants and, um, and that's when I think my sensitivity to um, the plants speaking accelerated. Mm. So mm. I, I really think, especially our medicinal plants and especially our medicinal weeds, are really, oh, this is going to sound super kooky, but I feel like I can say it to you. <laughs> <clears throat> they really want us, us, meaning humanity, um, to wake up and be in that conversation with them because they have so much to offer us and we really, really need them right now. So anyone who's even tiniest chink open to it, it can happen quite quickly, um, I believe. Mm. Yeah. So you're talking, which plants are we talking here when you think? Um, I'm talking like which plant, which wild medicinals, do you mm. mean? Yeah. Um, so elderberry is a potent one. Yeah, I write about elderberry in the book. Um, it's it's not only potent medicinally, but in, in for European people and folklore as well. It's a magical tree mm. and a magical um, medicinal plant. Um, along the Manawatu River here, we've got mullen growing, um, which is a really unique and interesting plant. Um, also quite a witchy plant. This has been called like a hag's taper or a witch candle <laughs> because um, people used to... Or witches or w wise women used to um, literally make candles with the with the tall stalks. They would dip, dip the, the semi-dried stalk or the dried stalk into beeswax and use them as candles. Um, but they're very powerful medicinally, especially for everything that we've just been through in the pandemic. So lots of um, medicinal properties for the chest mm. and the lungs. Um, and then a real thrill for me is that, I don't know about you, but sometimes I have this idea that a herb comes from the northern he northern hemisphere. We can't get it where we are. Um, so I I have um, not amazing periods, and I was um, buying shepherd's purse from the northern hemisphere, which is not great in terms of food miles. Um, and then I one day I just happened to find it like right where I live by the river, and I was so shocked because I had I had told myself it was something that I had to buy, and I wouldn't be able to find it. Where I was and I wasn't even looking for it I was looking for something else and I knew because I'd read about the plant like shepherd's purse is a very unique plant in that it's very powerful for um, women's health especially uterine health and the I don't know if you've seen shepherd's purse have you yes yeah, so, I found it in my garden growing as well <laughs> yeah so I think you know does it just turn up when where there are women who need it I don't know but but the plant has these tiny little um, they're not flowers, they're sort of, um, I can't think of the word, but they're almost uterus shaped. They are. Aren't they? Little, the, almost little heart shaped. Heart, so really yeah, heart can... slash uterus shaped. Um, yes. They're not quite leaves either. What are they, more? I, sure. don't, I don't know the botanical <laughs> name for that. I'll need to find out. Yeah, but, yeah, but they're, sort of, they're sort of pendulous in a way. Mm. In a way that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, with foraging, uh, lots of the the wild foods are almost like you can eat a lot of the greens. You can eat a lot of greens and, and they're fine. But um, 
some of them are quite bitter and chewy and things. So, so where they come into a space of being um, really into, into their real power is in the, in the medicinal way. So you can make tinctures and you can make teas mm. and um, oximals and all kinds of things. So it doesn't matter that they're sort of bitter or chewy or <laughs> whatever. Just, no, that's right. Yeah. It's just, yeah, and, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I've, in, in the work that I've done, I've been able to travel around the world doing permaculture and it's so amazing how a lot of these plants are just everywhere. Mm. You think, oh, I didn't expect to see you here. Yeah. Hello there. <laughs> <laughs> and there they are. Yeah, um, uh, something I've done quite a bit if I'm working, I mean, I I don't do a lot of foraging, guided foraging walks or all that sort of thing because um, like I work as a writing teacher and I don't want to sort of, to have everything I love be something that has to be public facing. But a few times I have led foraging walks or just taught friends about uh, wild foods a little bit. Um, it's something I really, really love to do because it's usually in a semi-urban setting for me. It's just walk to the edge of a field and it can even mm -hmm. be like a really quite barren looking playing field, like a rugby field or whatever. And mm -hmm. I'll just walk us off the path, like two steps in and I'll say, okay, just look at this little bit under our feet like there's you know there's plantain and there's wild cress and <laughs> I can see and there's all these lane, yeah there's <laughs> mullen coming up um you know oh there's yeah. a baby nettle that will probably get mown tomorrow but um and, and usually just underneath our feet um is at least 10 plants and people are just like you know, they yeah. just can't believe it because they look down and they just see lawn and I yeah. look down and I see food and medicine <laughs> It's interesting, isn't it? Sort of almost like the places we walk through in nature when we're when we're grown up in an urban environment, the the, the greenery is sort of a backdrop, mm. as opposed to the foreground and the context within which we we grow. Yeah, and I, I I noticed this so much, and I might have told this story before on the podcast, but mm. my when my daughter went to university, she just started down at in. Um, Canberra last year so this is her second year just coming now and I because she's grown up in this eco village surrounded by permaculture gardens and wildfires and we'd always walk around and we'd be talking about plants and harvesting you know that thing about she would know what all the plants are and mm. we'd do talks and she would explain to all the school group camps are coming oh this is this this is what you can use it for so there she is on campus and I took her down we're walking through the campus and we're noticing all the food plants oh there's some like edible grevillea flowers and there's this and there's that and all oh, the weeds on the corner and we, we're just talking about how she could eat so much from the campus anyway so I came back up home and and uh she she continued on met some people and as she was walking through she started to talk about these things and they just looked down and said what did <laughs> What are you talking about? How do you know this stuff? Like, you know, I wouldn't need anything <laughs> from the ground. Like, they yeah. dirty. Like, and she was, it just hit her that how, mm. what she thought was normal mm. as an awareness of the plants that surround her and hold her were just not seen. Absolutely. Were invisible. Yeah, and, a, uh, the idea of the green wall, um, I, that came, I don't know where that's from. Somebody before us wrote that, but it's a great um it's a great way of um, understanding how, because like, like you and I are fairly aware of plants and plants' identity, but to someone that hasn't really stepped into that world yet, they, like you say, they just look out the window and they just see a mass of green, or they step into the forest and they just see a mass of green. They maybe notice that there's some big trees and some small things, but nothing has a name or a personality or a, or you know, it's it's just or green. <laughs> Um, so yeah, part of part of getting into foraging is is the beautiful thing about foraging is that it, it really lights people up when they can then go for a walk and start to know some plants and yeah. and then they start it's like it opens their eyes and they start seeing in a new way. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And it start and that's something when you realise that it's like how held you can be by the place in which you are. It's mm. like oh, there's food here. There's food everywhere. There's food. <laughs> I, you know, I can eat. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have to go. I can eat this, mm. <laughs> and that, that sort of sense of of abundance, yeah, that nature holds that you didn't realize when there's that sense of limit and lack and and you know having to have just enough money to buy stuff all the time. All of a sudden, breaks out of that sense of how we relate to place and how we relate to community. And I know this is something that you talk a lot about 
in in your book is this sort of radical reciprocity and Mm -hmm. and there was one story in the book that I really loved you talking about how when you were at university and your lecturer and anthropology and anthropology was talking about um, the green dollars. Uh, maybe you could just share a bit of that story here because I thought that was just so um, uh, just so pointed at, at our lack of relationship with mm. this. Yeah, yeah so I, uh, the town where I grew up is a small town with a fr- large freezing works in the middle and, as I said, my father was a butcher and he worked down at the freezing works and um, so it wasn't... It, it was a really strong community and a, a really enmeshed community and a really bonded community, but um, it wasn't like a hippie community, you know. It was like a working-class community, I suppose. But I was lucky enough, as well as lucky enough to grow up in nature, I was lucky enough to grow up with that. So there was lots of um, mutual support and swapping and um, skills trading and caring for each other's children and all that sort of thing. Um, because it was a small town and a close community. Um, And so that was just part of what I came up with as well. And so when I first started reading about permaculture and read the principles and all that sort of thing, um, it, of course, there was so much to learn. But also, firstly, I felt just like relief, like this is a familiarity to me that I had, you know, I grew up with what I grew up with and then went into the wider world and sort of didn't see it so much and then found permaculture and, and I just felt, yeah, like I, I just could recognise those principles and that ecological way of um, approaching the world. So it was just so, it just was so exciting and a huge relief to me. And yeah, and because I've always been an activist as well, I think I found permaculture at a point where I was getting very fatigued with traditional activism, the the pushing against things. And so I found permaculture just at that moment where I needed something like very practical and grounded and something um, that was um, like generative rather than (laughs) oppositional. I totally hear you. And I wonder, actually, I don't know if there's any studies ever being done about this, but I think a lot of people, like I've, as you were speaking, I thought, well, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> that's me too, totally. Mm. I wonder how many other people too have come to permaculture from that way, wanting to be an, an activist, to speak up, to speak out, to mm. to share a different concept of what is possible, but found that really exhausting and, mm. you know, coming out of, you know, it's part of a peace movement that felt like I was always fighting stuff. I was part of a forest movement that felt like I was always like angry and mm. thought that humanity was a, you know, a, a blight on the planet. Whereas, yeah. uh, you know, it didn't ever feel right inside. It felt all knotted. Mm. And then, you know, this, this paradigm, this ecological paradigm, this ecological consciousness, it's the paradigm within which permaculture is based and it feels completely different because it's in that different worldview an ecological worldview and um yeah it's it's uplifting and the perma youth have i love the words that they use like they talk about themselves as practivists like positive Mm. practical activists like permaculture activists like it is that generative uh approach to think about what what can i wake up and do today Mm. that's actually making a contribution to showing a different way forward or adding to what's going on in the community or supporting the you know the local food movement and there's a few things that I really um, wanted to pick up too because we haven't talked about it a lot yet is food like <laughs> yeah and this this is kind of core to a lot of what you're talking about is that like this food activism food sharing food commons mm-hmm. and how the I think you know the awareness of the food of the commons and of mm-hmm. the food commons I think is an incredibly powerful <laughs> and a way of seeing the world that opens up a lot of doors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a few things we were talking about just before we came on, you know, about crop swaps and things. And I wonder, you know, maybe you could just talk a little bit about how, what is the commons and Mm -hmm. and how does that come through your relationship with your community food? Yeah, well, um, I think, like, for where I'm at in life, you know, 51 and two grown-up kids still at home, um, yeah, I think the most effective way for me to be an activist at the moment, um, like I, I'm very much, is very much acting locally, uh, you know, the, the old adage of think global, act local. So I'm a passionate local vore and local food resilience person. And I think um, like 
being an urban permie is a great way of being an activist because of the things I was talking to you about before. If you're living your values in a way where you seem happy and energized by what you're doing and your garden and your house looks different from all the neighbors around you, like is there any greater way to to seed out quite radical ideas than just by <clears throat> being a very public um, example of everything you believe. Um, yeah, and, and I think food, like we all need to eat, every human needs to eat. So um, food is a wonderful way of cutting across all the things that can divide us, like class, race, age, um, beliefs, all that sort of thing. And so, um, as I was saying to you just before we got on um, the podcast, um, I'm one of the co-facilitators of our local crop swap. And we do that in a neighbor, a neighborhood that's quite diverse in all the ways. And so um, it's it's not all permaculture people that attend. It's a real mix of the community. And when I'm standing at Crop Swap and I'm looking around who's there and I'm looking at the conversations everybody's happening, I just think this is so, this is such a radical event. Like it might seem like a twee thing, like a, a bunch of gardeners in a community hall, you know, talking about plants it can seem twee from one lens but from my worldview lens <laughs> i feel like it's it's radical because we have cut through um lots of divides there's a real range of ages races backgrounds beliefs and we're all elbow to elbow with something that's really important to everybody which is food and wanting to feed ourselves good food um, and just because the kaupapa or the, sorry, that's a Māori word, the um, intention of crop swap is one of radical generosity. Um, it's, a, it's a cashless, moneyless exchange. <laughs> and it's not a one-to-one -one exchange. Like you don't say, I'll give you two pairs for your pumpkin or whatever. <laughs> it's just like, here's what I've got to share. Everybody take it. <laughs> um, and so it sort of feels like a market that's free, not, not free market in the neoliberal sense, but <laughs> a market where you don't have to spend money. I that, love that. It's like it is a free market and it totally smashes the concept of what free market is. <laughs> <laughs> um, people who are new to it, just are, are so their minds are blown open by it. And um, I think it builds community swiftly in that way. So if they're new, they come. At first they're confused. That, but then they're lit up and delighted and then they come back and then they tell people about it and they bring people along and they start to get a little bit more generous with every time they come because they start to trust that their generosity will be met with the generosity of others. Um, yeah, that's why I think it's a wild, mm. wildly radical event. <laughs> it is wildly radical and we were talking <laughs> too as well about this this notion of trust and you mentioned about you know people wanting to pay for pay for it mm. and and uh i think this is a really interesting like shifting from a, a a monetary economy for everything into this community exchange reciprocal and and like you're saying it's not necessarily a one for one thing isn't it? it's like mm. here's what i come with today you know i've had an abundance of pumpkins in my garden today so here they all are but next month there might not be that much but yet it, it all kind of balances out and trusting that and being in that flow and not and stepping away from that expectation that it has to be like a direct one for one all the time mm. and and uh, taking away that sort of monetary value mm. it does it does rattle our cages in terms of what we've kind of been raised in a monetary economy to mm. to expect and feeling and I guess too is that Mon the money helps us to stay separated and not feel like we owe anyone anything, but mm. yet obligation and responsibility and connection is a big part of actually grounding ourselves and being in in a relationship with community that will hold us and in a relationship with land that will hold us. And that's something that you'd experienced at at your crop swap as well, I think, you know, this money relationship mm. you were talking about before. Yeah, yeah. Um... Sometimes when people are very new, if they walk in and they're a little bit confused by what it's all about, what, what's happening, um, that they're sort of cautious and they'll, they'll say, oh, let me give you $5 for this lovely cabbage or, you know, oh, let me let me 
give you some money or some gold coins or whatever. And um, yeah, we usually just slide the money back and go, no, 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 you take it. It's for you, you know. Um, or I try to use the language of, um, um, no, no, you're helping us by um, like adopting this pumpkin so it doesn't go to waste because there's nobody else that can eat it. So you're actually helping us by <laughs> taking like adopt a pumpkin you know what i mean so that yeah. not feeling like they're extracting something it's like you're helping us like i grew all this food and i put a lot of work into growing the food and you're helping me by by um taking it so i feel good that nothing i created was wasted so um you're actually helping me by taking it yeah um, yeah i don't know i just try to try to bust out that thinking of that they're getting something for nothing yeah, and I, I really love that. You know, it's that it shifts that it totally shifts the relationship and that radical, uh, radical reciprocity approach. And just something so easy to set up, really, isn't it? A few mm. friends, and you can start that, yeah. and then just allow it to to build and grow. And and you know, people will share the invitation out. And mm. I wonder what other kind of local local or local community kind of initiatives happen in and around your place that help to generate that kind of conversation yeah oh we've got a yeah we've got quite a lot of things going on um there's a community group called growing gardens and communities which is a bit of an unwieldy title but the work they do is so beautiful so they um they go into the backyards or patios of people in low in low income housing or council housing who who are keen to get growing but maybe have never learned anything or um, don't have the money, the time, you know, the whatever. They, they, they're very beginners, is my point. Um, and so this group goes in. It's kind of like a perma blitz, I suppose, but it's not so, it's a, it's a little more small scale than that. You're not doing the whole yard, obviously, because we're talking about rentals where people might have okay. a bit of house, housing insecurity where they can't plant fruit trees, maybe. Um, but they put in small garden beds, um, up to three, as many as the the new gardener feels they can handle and then um the, the little beds themselves are a, a, a industrial waste product so it's like untreated wood it's like these flames that these are uh, frames that these big industrial parts come in and so they they pack down flat and and so the the group just needs to open them up plonk them on the ground put soil in so it's sort of a, within a few hours a family can suddenly have a wee garden um, Fantastic. Yeah, or if they can't, yeah. if they can't even, you know, if the landlord doesn't want them to have a garden, um, we can give them container gardens and just give them some, you know, some silver beets and some herbs and things. So they're an amazing yeah. local group. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then um, Environment Environment Network Manawatu, which is our local um, NGO, environmental big environmental NGO, um, has built a relationship with Kainga Order, and Kainga Order is our government um, housing agency so again this is folks with who have very little and the government is supporting them into a house um, and so ENM has facilitated a program where again similar to the growing gardens programs where um, Kayanga order tenants can have container gardens or um, small garden beds and are supported to do that and the thing with teaching people how to grow food is that it needs to be an ongoing relationship. If you're brand new to gardening and you're a bit scared of it all and you've never had your hands in the soil, just like chucking a garden down and walking away is not enough. So again, mm -hmm. it's all about relationship and it's and that's where it's very local activism because everybody's sort of staying put long enough to have an ongoing relationship. So the Growing Gardens and Communities Group, they don't jump and run. <laughs> they go back they'll schedule visits to go back and support and when they go back they'll turn up with seedlings and maybe a hose attachment or bits and pieces um so that, that so that that person can carry on learning and they're not just thrown in the deep end fantastic oh it sounds like so many and this is the thing about like really localizing it. like what is the need in your community and i think that's the thing isn't it what you know really finding out who who is it in our place mm -hmm that could do with this and and find find an appropriate response it's not a cookie cutter approach of <laughs> is a here's how you do this kind of action or here's how you do this kind of action it's really growing out of a need in a community it sounds yeah, amazing well i think urban permaculture is is really exciting because i mean i think all permaculture is exciting but i think in terms of um grounded activism and, and things that can happen quite swiftly 
in, in locavore, things around locavorism. Um, mm. Urban permaculture is amazing in that way because um, things that you do catch catch the attention of many quite quickly. And I know that um, in reading your book too that you started up a, a mother's group at one point, which I guess is had some sort of relation to, to plants and permaculture and <laughs> raising children. I wonder if you want to speak a bit to your experience of, of permaculture with motherhood and, you know, particularly with, you know, your children, your experience? Hmm. Um, yeah, I've got uh, my youngest son has autism. Um, and so he went, he's not like this anymore, thank goodness he's 19, but um, from the age of about three and a half to the age of about seven, um, his autism, um, the way it presented was he was nonverbal, he was um, kind of unpredictable, he was a, a sensory seeker who liked to like, smash our crockery and <laughs> smash light bulbs and um, drop my pot plants on the floor because of his sensory seeking. Um, and he would push other children over as part of his sensory seeking, not because he was being naughty, but it was like a manifestation of his autism. So during that period, I ended up again, like nature was such a balm in that time because I could take the boys and we could go to the bush or the forest or the playground or the river or the creek behind the house. And it really held us all when we were going through that really difficult time. We couldn't really be around other people because his behaviour was um, too erratic. Now, obviously, I felt quite lonely then, but I would feel lonely when I was at home or lonely when I felt like I was missing out on something. But then when I went outside, I felt better and I felt held and supported by the natural world um yeah and so yeah I did at one point do a call out for <laughs> any um like other mums who felt really passionately about local food and foraging and all that sort of thing and made um I just put a notice up in my in our local health shop <laughs> and I got a reasonable response and we just started having cups of tea and then very quickly because we we're all similarly aligned in terms of beliefs and politics and all that sort of thing just very quickly turned into quite a great mutual aid thing where we were swapping clothes and swapping cloth nappies and cooking for each other if somebody was ill and you know foraging together and one one of them was had um bees and so she would make us lovely um you know uh medicinal things with her honey um and that just happened from me having a brave moment and putting a notice up <laughs> it's so fantastic I love that story I mean and it, it just that little moment of courage yeah to activate something can manifest something really so beautiful and nourishing and helpful yeah yeah yeah, yeah I mean there's yeah. A, I think it's Terence McKenna saying of find the others hey find the <laughs> others they're out there somewhere where are they where are my people <laughs> <laughs> so, do you want to, I'd, I'd love to talk to you a little bit too about you, you mentioned um before we switched on about permaculture and ableism uh yeah what how how does that show up for you and how would you like to kind of invite people into considering mm. this more yeah so um I was lucky, really, really lucky, um, the way I was able to do my permaculture certificate because there's a local place here called Slow Farm where they offered uh, a permaculture design certificate over, um, it could either be one year or two years depending on how much time you had. So they were very flexible and open to like busy families and, and people with onerous jobs and all that sort of thing. Um, so we would get together uh, once a month for a really big day I think it was like 8 till 5 p.m. or whatever, but it, but it was just once a month or whatever, um, which made it really doable. And I and I know also, Maura, you have online permaculture mm -hmm. design certificates, which is fantastic for people that uh, take leave people home. Can take <laughs> as, long as, they, as long as they want, as yeah. long as they need, and yeah. come for, for as long as they want to, yeah. Yeah, because so many permaculture design certificates are, you have to go away to this remote place for two to three weeks. It costs you a lot of money at once and you need to be really, you need to live there and you need to be focused on what you're doing. So that leaves out anyone that has a big care load, um, you know, whether they're elderly parents or, or children that need more support. Um, it's financially a barrier. And um, <clears throat> sometimes I think there's a bit of physical ableism in permaculture. Don't, it's not intentional, obviously. Um, but it's sort of like the presumed default is a younger 
fit, healthy, <laughs> energetic person. And it's um, it, we have to be really careful in permaculture that we consider mm -hmm. everyone that's in our in our worlds, like elderly people, people with physical difficulties, health issues, um, disabilities, um, uh, mental health problems. Um, you know the whole gamut of people. How can we include everybody and and um, and also like when I see permaculture based communities setting themselves up, um, eco villages and things, uh, there's often these sorts of ableist barriers to that as well. Like, um, cause I, I'm on the new permaculture New Zealand Facebook page and I'll see these beautiful offers like come and live on our, you know, our lovely place. <laughs> but it's will say things like, um, we have one tiny home that sleeps one person and you need to be able to, you need to be quite fit and well because we will need you to do this and da da da. And that's fine. I mean, there's, there's different offers for different people. Um, but what you don't see very often is come and be part of our eco village. You can bring your family, even if you have a disabled kid and even if you have <laughs> a husband who has a day job that he has to do, so he can't come out and help in the garden and, you know, another child that's really socially anxious and, you're not super fit yourself and or, or you have an elderly parent you need to bring or whatever so um yeah, yeah. in these yeah. ways i would really like us all us permies to to really open up to those um questions around how we can we invite everybody in and how can we live together and support each other even yeah. if we're not a young fit thing that's going to be able to do you know intensive gardening or whatever because i mean as we know like permaculture is a an ecologically um, informed design system that we should be able to apply to anything, not just gardens and, and the natural world. Mm -hmm. um, but we can get a bit, we can sway a bit too much that way and forget about the social permaculture, which social permaculture is such a beautiful, rich world and there's so much yeah. more for us to do there in terms of accessibility. Yeah, There's a, there's a permaculture educator called I just wrote that wrote it down here. Katie Shepherd. Do you know Katie's work? Yeah. 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 And she she has a disability herself and her the real focus for her is ableism and permaculture. So just wanted to mention her name. So if other people are interested in this, they can go and look at Katie's website. Um she brings these issues to the fore in a really gentle, creative way. She does. And you know what I really love too about her work, I met her recently um Again, I, I met her online, but I met her at the Permaculture Conference last year in, mm. in the UK. I really love her artwork mm. as well, like the way it's such a gentle way. And so, you know, it's an, isn't it amazing? It's like you say that there's this sense that there's a one-dimensional way to show up with permaculture, but there's not. There's a whole ecosystem of ways of expressing, whether it be through art or writing or organising or holding space or mm -hmm. stepping up as, with the courage to invite or, you know, could be down there digging this whale or whatever, but there are <laughs> lots of different things. You know, I even just think about our little local fire brigade here. There's this, you know, there's some people are out fighting the fires, but there's other people who are kind of making sure that the, the fire fire folk are fed you know yes. and, and like that's a big role like unless they're fed and, and, and held when they come back they can't go out again and so there's all these different multiple dimensions all the time that are all valuable part of that ecosystem and I think like you're saying really recognizing the value of and the importance of focusing on the people care dimension mm. of permaculture mm. and so mm. it's you know, it's, I always see social permaculture as, as part of the whole permaculture and I really resist it being plucked out and made as a separate mm, thing because it's, I think it has to be part of the whole rather than saying, okay, this is permaculture and then we'll have a social permaculture mm. over here. You know, mm -hmm. like all those ethics all together intertwining is where that richness lands. Yeah, and, um, it, like social mm. permaculture shouldn't be a nice to have. It should be. No, it should be really just, interwoven yeah, right. with embedded the whole the heart, thing. Yeah, yeah. and, and that, yeah. that can come right down to even like our our hui, our um, our gatherings and conferences and things. How can mm. we make? How can we design? Use our permaculture design skills to design them so yes. that you don't have to be kind of young, wealthy, and fit and free <laughs> to come yes. to something like this. Make that design zero. That's the heart yeah. of the design. Yeah, there's going to yeah. be childcare. There's going to be someone that can look after someone with health needs. There's going to be 
you know, what even what even needs to happen to yeah, enable- personal permaculture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to ask you a little bit, you're a writer, you teach writing. And uh, do you teach people how to do permaculture writing, I wonder? Oh, uh, no, well, not, I don't, I, I probably do, but I don't, um, you know, I don't come clean about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I find so, sneak it into, and well, I've taught, that. what I mean by that is I've taught nature writing. And uh, so okay. I don't think, because of just who I am and my life experience, I don't think I can be someone that teaches nature, nature writing without there being a whole lot of um, permaculture yeah. philosophy just sort of around, sitting around that. Yeah. But, but I've never, no, I've never like advertised no. or, or, or sort of create a container that is permaculture writing. I've never done yeah. that. It's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. We'd love to, I'd love to host a class with you on that. But, <laughs> but to, um, I'd love to ask you about your process of writing yourself. So mm-hmm. as you were writing mm-hmm. your book, um, so this is, a forage slab. So this is this is your story, mm-hmm. you know, about about your childhood and and your awakening and really bringing in so much about yeah permaculture and nature connection and it's such a rich story. Like how did you how did you sit and write this? Like was it <laughs> did you write a bit every day? Like what's your practice yeah. of writing? I suppose for something like this to emerge that's just so has such whole sense about it. it's not like a how-to book it's it's an all of you hmm. book um I think it was a like slow slow fast sort of book so mm-hmm. for about a, a decade leading up to it I'd gotten deeply into nature writing I was reading a lot of nature writing and talking nature writing with writer friends and playing around with it and some of the bits in A Forest Life started out as little bits of essays and things um but mm-hmm. then and I, I felt like I was working towards something that was a nature memoir, but I hadn't kind of worked out the shape of it. And then once I got the contract with Harper Collins, it was a really tight deadline. I had to deliver a complete first draft in nine months, at which stage I was super grateful of all that thinking I had done before <laughs> and, and, and living I'd done before. So I had stuff to pull from. Um, so suddenly after I can take all the time I want to do this because nobody cares and then suddenly I was like oh my god I have to deliver a full draft in, in nine months uh, less than a year so um, uh, I rented a little um, studio space outside my house so I could have a bit of brain space and quiet from our very busy household and then um, nobody wants to hear this probably but I got up at 6 a.m. <laughs> Um, every morning because my brain is sharpest in the morning and I knew this about myself so I got up at 6am every morning for the period I was writing that first draft I handed over organizing the rest of the family in the morning to my partner Fraser I was like it's not forever but I just need you to to take this on for a while and then I um, wrote from I would usually write from about 6am to 11 pretty solidly um, which probably doesn't sound like that long but you can actually do a lot of writing in that amount of time and then I would have a really decent break for some food and a bit of a breather. And then I would do a couple of hours of um, other sort of work towards the book, like reading or, um, you know, editing bits and pieces or whatever. And then I'd stop sort of two-ish. And, and that's how, yeah, that's how that's the practical of how it happened. <laughs> um, I really love hearing you say that because some people say, oh, I'll just grab a moment here or there, like an hour here or there to write. And I just feel like I'm only just getting into my mm-hmm. brain space yeah. in that time and like actually cordoning off, like putting a nice little boundary around a chunk of time. Yeah. Makes sense. Oh, uh, yeah. I think um, it's really important because you can't, I mean, I, I also write in snatches a lot, like, um, because that's life, you know, you don't have the luxury of what I'm describing to you. The, the only way I was able to do that economically was that I just basically took a year, a vow of poverty for a year and did very little. I did do other additional work, but, but um, you know, I, I didn't work for money so that I could work on the book because I felt that opportunity was really important. Um, so... It, it's, it can be really difficult, just talking about ableism, it can be really difficult to have the luxury of a whole morning's writing. But um, but if, if you can in any way do it, even if it's just one day a week, even if it's Sunday, 
Um, mm -hmm. It's how you go deeper with your work, I think, and it's how more interesting structures can emerge out of the work because they've just got more time to. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's really valuable if it's at all possible. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And you, you also have a nature journaling book. Mm. Can you share a little bit about what, how that came about? And It's not nature journaling specifically. It's called Right to the Centre, um, mm. W, right? Right to the Centre. Um, and because my whole adult life I've kept a journal, I've got a, a, a yeah, practice of journaling and quite visual journaling as well as writing. And so Right to the Centre was a book about um, how the practice of keeping a journal um, feeds you emotionally and creatively. And it was lots of bits out of my own journal. And then each chapter has some how-to stuff at the end. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a combination of um, sharing my own stuff and hopefully um, activating work in other people. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think, um, I mean, poets, because I, I came up as a poet first when I was you know, a baby writer, poets need to observe a lot and so um journaling is a great way of of waking up your your looking in the world and then i think having um that kind of looking is really important for permaculture as well because one of our principles is observe and interact <laughs> right and so that one can sound really boring like what, what does it mean to walk out your door and look at something but anyone that's had a garden knows the power of every day doing a lap of, guard, of, of the garden and observing and then from the observing comes interacting because you see what needs to be done and you see what needs to be harvested and it turns it from an abstract thing in your head, I am a gardener and like occasionally I tend to my garden, to a really lived thing and a mm -hmm. relational thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah I talk about it, it's like um, I sort of had this epiphany a little while ago thinking I am the garden gardening like when you're in that relationship with the garden in that deep observation and responsiveness as opposed to reactiveness that that observation gives you the information how to respond so you kind of the garden tells you what you need to to be doing and how to be in relationship and yeah. so that's that's a beautiful way of taking that and and the journaling helps to bring you to that state, I think, to, mm -hmm. to be in that state of, of deeper observation and over time. I think time is the big part of this that, you know, you can, you can go out and observe, but if you just go and do it once and note it down, do a site analysis, then it's not quite enough, is it? It's that observation over time mm -hmm. and that reflective practice yeah, that you Yeah, hopefully, hopefully daily if you, if you can manage it daily. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, well, there's a... A contemporary philosopher I like called um, his name's Bayo Komalafe. Oh, I love Bayo's work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says the times the times are urgent. We must slow down. And whenever mm -hmm. I'm getting kind of tizzy and like ah, the world's on fire. What am I <laughs> going to do about it? But I just try to bring that back to mind um, yeah. because I feel like if everyone's running with the hair on fire and you're holding it together and you're going slower and you're saying, hey, look over here, we could maybe try this. That catches yeah. attention more than more panic and more fuel yeah. on fires that are already burning quite brightly. Yeah. Uh, he also yeah. says, um, I, I can't quote this one directly, but he says stuff about that we can't um, fix the problems we see around us with the same materials and systems from which they're constructed, which mm. sort of speaks to the first one in a way. Yeah. And I think also Tyson Young Kapoor has said similar things from you know from his indigenous wisdom perspective in a different way, but sort of the similar idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. And both of those help me a lot when I feel like I'm not doing enough, or I'm not, not doing it right, or I'm not doing it like I don't spend a lot of time writing submissions anymore or going to council meetings because I don't have a lot of faith and trust in the systems of those. <laughs> institutions and there are other people who still have enough energy to do that and I think it's okay that I'm over here being a weird poet lady because I'm you know <laughs> I'm I'm still doing my activism I'm just doing it in a way that works for where I'm at now and a way where because I I feel I, I am more energized for my activism 
on a very one-to-one -one level when I when I can see someone light up in front of me, like that hyperlocal thing, rather than achieving some massive um, institutional broad stroke thing. And both mm -hmm. are important. I'm not saying one's more important than the other, but you've just got to find your own sustainable mm -hmm. activism. And so for me, that's what I think what's really is. great about the hyperlocal, what you're talking about there is that we often diminish it or it gets diminished. Like we, like if you're doing it, it doesn't feel small, but it gets diminished saying, well, that's just that little bit there. But mm -hmm. when you think about it through this sort of mycelial frame that we're actually part of this mycelial network of people doing these hyperlocal things everywhere mm -hmm. and that it's actually wrapping the whole planet. You don't have to scratch very far anywhere to see these hyperlocal responses. It's like the earth responding through these hyperlocal relationships that are that are happening and i think that's that there's a huge strength in that and if if someone sees like walking past your place something different and mm -hmm. gets inspired by it you'll never actually know the impact that you're having and then who they talk to and they start their garden or they grab some seeds and pass them on you don't actually know mm -hmm. the impact it could actually be really quite vast but it's through a different system of change than what we often recognise as mm. being the kind of change that we value. Mm. And, and we're so wedded to urgency in the West. Mm. And so, and you know, it's constantly feel like it's got to happen now, it's got to happen soon. Especially if you do activism, um, like in opposition to institutions of power, so much of that kind of activism has a, an urgency about it, which burns people out really, really quickly. Yeah. And yeah. so... Uh, you know, and, and and you've had amazing Indigenous thinkers on your podcast. Something as Westerners, um, or as a Westerner, I really draw from listening to those Indigenous speakers. Mm. Is is and it's hard because we're so enculturated, but dropping that urgency and just like talking to what you just said, um, trusting in the long story and the big story, yeah. and you know, like you say, we can't even know totally the effect we're having um but if i can drop the urgency and trust in the longer story you know it could be that a tree a tree i plant um gives fruit to people in seven generations time or whatever you yeah. know we just don't know isn't that, isn't that that is the that's the you know this notion of time that i was talking about before and, and actually being able to drop into this this long story the long view and i and it's really what i think when you think deeply about what permaculture means we're talking about how do we create cultures of permanence like cultures that can be continued long into mm. the future like it's it is about that like I, some people talk to me about well I don't know if I like the word permanent because you know everything changes all the time yes everything does change but there's a sense that it can continue and it can continue to be enriching and and um and resilient and robust and and beautiful and uh yeah, long view, yeah. time. Yeah, I think it's a and, and like regenerative is 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 what it is more than permanent, right? It's yeah, not that we yeah. want <clears throat> so much permanent permanent structures as that we want regenerative structures that yeah. um and mutually supportive systems. Yes. So yeah, yeah, not as permanent as in stuck, yeah. but yeah, something that will continue and continue to you know life is inherently regenerative yes. life is inherently creative <laughs> life inherently has this sort of conscious awareness about it and mm. it's like maintaining the ability for that to thrive so how can we can maintain the conditions for life to thrive mm. so yeah we just need to get out of the way half the time as humans <laughs> the idea of per per permissive permaculture um, yeah yeah like give give nature the I don't like this idea of permission in this context, but get yeah. out of the way, humans. Like, let, yeah. like, Give yourself the permission to get out yes. of the way. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Oh, look, it's been absolutely fabulous um, chatting with you today. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, now, where can people find all of your work? What's the best? Uh, awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so A Forager's Life is available as um, a paper book, Hard copy book, and also it's um, an ebook and an audio book. It just came out on audio book. Um, yeah, fantastic. Especially narrated by a wonderful Australian actress. So uh, yeah, so and it was fun when when she was recording it. We were WhatsApping back and forth about how to pronounce Maori words and 
how, how <laughs> should nice. we say words without an Australian accent? Um, it was really heaps of fun. Um, anyway, so that's available on you know all the usual book booky places um, yeah. on online book bookstores. Um, and then I have a website which is just my name dot com Helen um, And then the, the social media I'm most active on is Instagram. So my Instagram is Helen M Lindoff. Great. Fantastic. We'll make sure that all of that is linked below in the show notes so listeners out there have a have a scroll down and you'll find all of that. Thank you so much, Helen. Uh, thank you for joining me on the show and thank you for writing this book. I, I can't recommend it highly enough to anyone who's listening. You know, it will really touch your heart and open your open your heart and your mind to seeing yourself in relationship with your home and your community in a different way. Oh, thank yeah, you so thank much you. for having me, Maura. Again, I really hope we, we get to receive a book from you sometime soon. <laughs> oh, I might need to tap you on the shoulder for a bit of coaching with that. <laughs> I know you have a, you have probably many books in you, but yeah, oh, the first one that's maybe the problem. That you know, I, every day I think oh, I'd like to write about that, or I'd like to write about that, and I just can't kind of mm-hmm. nail it down. As well as carve out the time mm-hmm. to do that, because I also have you're very um, busy. Well, now two, two boys at home who are who are unschooling boys and um, one in particular is a very busy boy. <laughs> I hear you. Yes, one moment to another, I hear you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I do the best that I can with the time that I have and and the book I figured is just going to have to wait. Hmm. <laughs> I think you're writing it even, you know, you're writing it just by your being in the world. It's, 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 it's writing itself inside you. Just, just as like a you know a pregnant woman is writing oh, yeah. a baby, yeah, she's, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that's probably. And so I find having conversations like this is a great way to to share ideas as well. Mm, you know, absolutely. Like what a what a gift to be able to have a chat with you today, mm. and how wonderful it is that we can then share that out into the world. And it you know it's not a written word, but the spoken word I think is also a really great way to be able to share ideas and and thoughts and to open up a few you know, like different perspectives on things. You know, maybe that's an opening chapter. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> there we go. There's the nugget. <laughs> thank you for that. Mm-hmm. All right, well, take care. Have a have a wonderful day. And um, thank you so much for sharing here today on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Sense Making the Changing World. Check out the show notes below to find the link to Helen's books and her body of work. And also check the notes to where to find details of our permaculture courses, our YouTube, blog and free masterclasses and film clubs. And make sure you're signed up to hear news and updates. And come and join us at the Permaculture Education Institute to learn practical skills for designing and teaching permaculture and making a good livelihood while living a permaculture-inspired, one-planet way of life. Take care and I look forward to your company in coming episodes.